Colgate smile and wish them a very, very happy Sabbath. Shake each other's hands in front, behind. Make sure you get to know someone new here this morning. We have a smaller crowd this morning, so it should be easier to get to know everybody and to shake into everybody's hands. And, uh, you know, the, the, the situation sometimes when the church is so big, people kind of get lost in the crowd and uh, it's good to know each other by name. God knows and numbers every number of our hairs. How much more should we take the effort to get to know each other as well, isn't it? Well, before we get into the message proper, I just want to ask you to please bow your heads with me once more before we pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful to be here this morning, to worship together, to be able to sing songs and praise to you, Lord, for you truly are worthy. And I just pray that you would be uplifted this morning, that we would have more of Jesus and less of self, more of you, Lord, and less of the world. So now as we turn our eyes into Scripture, I pray that you help us to put aside all our distractions. Help us, Father, to see Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are continuing our study on the sanctuary, and this morning we are going to look at the gospel of colors. And we are going to start here in Exodus 27 and verse 16. I've taken the liberty to put all the text back onto the screen. But here in Exodus 27 and verse 16, we are reading about the gate of the court. And the Bible says this, And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of 20 cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. So we are looking particularly at the entrance to the sanctuary, the gate here that we have, and the only entrance really that you could go in and out of that tabernacle. And so how were gates used in the Bible? Who does that gate represent? Well, we see here in Genesis 3.24, the Bible reads, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now we don't see particularly a gate there mentioned. However, there was only that one way into the Garden of Eden. And as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God placed an angel, a cherubim there to guard the way to the tree of life, lest man should eat it and sin would be immortalized forever. And so the gate there was really a gate that was, in a sense, barring them into the Garden of Eden because of sin. But then we go a few chapters later in Genesis 28 and verse 17. The Bible says this, and he, speaking of Jacob, he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So what gate was this? A gate to heaven, but it really was a vision that Jacob had when he had deceived his father and, and stolen the birthright from his brother, and he was running for his life because his brother Esau wanted to kill him, and God gives him this vision of a ladder going up to heaven, and he wakes up and says, this is the gate of heaven. It was a gate to accept sinners. Not quite like the entrance into the Garden of Eden. This one was accepting of even those that had committed sin. Then we see another gate in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14. The Bible says, straight is the gate. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto where? To life and few there be that find it. You know that word straight is not like, T-R-A-I-G-H-T, that's a straight and not a windy road, but the word straight there actually means difficult. Very few will enter in 
through those gates. And if you apply it to the sanctuary that we're looking at, the reason why probably few will find entrance into those heavenly gates is because they haven't humbled themselves enough to realize and to say, you know what, I was wrong. What I have done is wrong. What I have committed is sin. In the age, in the day that we live, we like to applause people for half-hearted effort. Isn't it? Come on, you can say that. We like to do it in church, even. That we're okay with last-minute, half-baked effort. And the reason why we do that is because you want to, quote-unquote, encourage people but friends, there's no encouragement that the Bible gives us when we are in sin. Are you with me? You see, it's very different. This gate is a straight gate. It's a difficult gate because many of us are not willing to sacrifice self, willing to humble themselves and say, you know what, God, I was wrong. But then finally we come to Revelation 22. And verse 14, the Bible says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. How are we allowed to enter that gate? We have to do his commandments. It's a high calling, isn't it? It's a very high calling. One that is out of reach without, with just human efforts. But Jesus says, with me, you can do everything. Amen? And so it is a difficult gate. It is a difficult gate. But Jesus says, I am that gate. In John 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door. And you see there in parenthesis, it means gate. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 14 and verse 6 the Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way in which we can enter into heaven. It has to be through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And that way, when he, when he says here, I am the way, when you cross-reference that with Psalms 77 and verse 13, he says, thy way is where? It's in the sanctuary. You cannot separate Jesus and the sanctuary. It's impossible to study the sanctuary. And we're talking about the Old Testament, a structure that has been done away with that we don't really go through anymore. But yet, if you do study it, God tells us you'll find Jesus. you find the Savior. He says you will find me. Acts 4 verse 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Friends, when you look at the sanctuary, there is only one gate. You cannot enter in any other way. There's only one entrance and only one way in and one way out. There's only one way to be cleansed of our sins. That's Jesus Christ. There's only one way to be made right with the Father, to be united and to be able to see God face to face. That is only through Jesus Christ. And so before we ever come to the gate, before we ever come to the entrance of the sanctuary, before we are even just standing there looking at the entrance, God has to be working upon our hearts already right? We would not come to the sanctuary if we did not feel our unworthiness, if we did not feel our sinfulness. And so even ever before we come to the sanctuary, God's already working on the heart, amen? And so now that we come to the sanctuary, it's only through Christ we can enter by faith in his shed blood. But that's not all, you see. There's other elements to this gate that we have to look at to understand. And so we're going to go back to that first text in Exodus 27 and verse 16. And we're going to look at all these elements that are described here. Because all these details were very important to the Israelites. 
Okay, so let's read this again. And for the gate of the court shall be in hanging of 20 cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework and the pillars shall be how many? Four. And then the entrance, how many were there? There would be, oh, pardon me, the sockets were four. But as a result, you had three entrances, right? So there were four pillars and the number four is very important in the Bible. What does the number four represent? The first place we find the number four mentioned is in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. It said, a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. So God had four rivers. It was the one that split into four and it would go out and it would water the whole of the Garden of Eden. It would go into all directions. Then we come to Jeremiah 49 and verse 36. And upon Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. Do you see that? There are four winds and they're scattering towards the four quarters of heaven. This is talking about the captivity of Israel. Jeremiah was constantly telling the people, surrender, don't fight against Babylon. And God said, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna scatter the people everywhere. And of course, today, very clearly, it is worldwide. So the number four represents whole world, okay? It represents what? The whole world. And we also see this in Revelation chapter seven and verse one. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. And they were doing what? Holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Four angels holding four winds that are about to blow on all the earth. They're standing at the four corners of the earth. So this is not talking about an earth that is square and flat. It is a reference, an allegory to represent the whole world. Amen? Amen? Okay. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8. Revelation 20 verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Speaking of that very end time, just before God destroys all sin and sinners once and for all, the, the wicked will be resurrected and the devil will now go out and deceive everybody who are in the four quarters of the earth. So what does the number four represent? Everybody. Jesus died for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. He didn't come for a particular race, a particular group of people. He didn't come just for the Israelites or for the Jews, the Hebrews. Jesus is for everybody. And you see this even when Jesus was alive. When he walked the earth, he ministered to the woman of Samaria. She wasn't a Jew. He would witness to that centurion servant of which he said, I found no greater faith than this man in all of Israel. And he wasn't even an Israelite. He would even heal the Canaanite woman's daughter where she would come and, and Jesus intentionally ignored her to teach his disciples an object lesson. And even she also had great faith. He would even heal the 10 lepers of which one was what? He was a Samaritan. The other nine kept running off even though they found out they were healed. They were running off to show themselves to the priest and the Samaritan realizing that he was healed, he was the only one that turned back and came and gave thanks to Jesus. And Jesus would ask, ask that question, weren't there 10? How come only one has come back? 
often where Jesus had his interaction with people. And in, in, in actual fact, when you, talk, when you do a study on faith in the Gospels, the only time that Jesus talked about great faith was in reference to those that were not Israelites. In, in a sense, telling us that those that are in the world have greater faith than those that are in the church often, isn't it? What a rebuke to us who have the word of God, who have the privileges of being able to walk and commune with God and having the scriptures to read on a daily basis. But even, I believe, it's true for us today as well. Those of great faith are those found often outside the church and not those that are in. And even Jesus himself would say in John 10, 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Friends, it's a reminder to us that there are many people that are out there that are not of this fold. We have to do our part in sharing the good news in sharing the, the gospel, the plan of salvation, about the last day events and how Jesus is coming soon to take us home, there is still a work for us to be done as a church. And so when we look at the number four, the whole world, Jesus is for everyone. But then we see the three entrances, right? And this is why I was talking about it's so important for the number of pillars, we see three entrances, and what do they represent? The number three. Number four is worldwide. Number three, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Often the number three is referring to the Godhead. We see this also mentioned in Matthew 28, and you see it in other places. When Jesus was baptized, Jesus was in the water. The Holy Spirit was coming down like a dove, and the voice from heaven saying, you are my son. And if I call you son, I must be what? The Father, right? So you see the Father, you see the Son, you see the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, the Bible says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So, when we come in the name of Jesus, He is the visible representative of all three of them. Do you see that? He is the only one that you can see. The Father dwells in the light which no man can approach unto, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit cannot be seen. Jesus is the only visible representative of all three of them. And all three are involved in the work of man's cleansing and also for our redemption. So yes, Jesus is ministering in the holy, most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary today, but he's not the only one that's busy. The Father is busy as well. And so is the Holy Spirit. You see that? So all three are involved in the work of our redemption and our salvation, and especially for our cleansing. And so that's why last week, when I showed you this picture, do you remember this? There is four gates, and you see how many pillars? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And this is why it's particular, because God is a particular God. And it was not four entrances and five pillars, but rather it is four pillars and three entrances. Do you see that? So these things are, are very important. God does care about these little details. He cares about the seventh day and not the sixth or the first or the second. He is very particular on the day that he has blessed and that he has made holy that he set apart for each and every one of us. So even in the sanctuary, these numbers are very important as well. And as a reminder, look, the children of Israel, they were blessed with all this understanding. It was constantly an object lesson, a teaching in parables when they came to the sanctuary. So in Bible Commentary, Volume 4, 1176, Paragraph eight, this is what Ellen White writes. 
all the washings and sprinklings enjoined in the ceremonial law were lessons in parables. Can you imagine if you brought your, your son or your daughter to the sanctuary, they'd be saying, what is that? Why this color? Why, why do we have to bring a lamb? You know, all these questions would be inquisitive from a little young mind who has no idea what's going on, right? And if the parent doesn't know, what would they do? What do they have to do back then? Ask the priest, right? And if you couldn't get a hold of the priest, well, you stand in line and wait for Moses. Because there was always a constant long line of people wanting to talk to him, isn't it? Moses, why this color? Moses, why three gates? Why not four? Why, why are you using this material? Uh, 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 you know, in Egypt, they, they use a different type of material, which is more, more hardy. So there'll be all sorts of questions that as a parent, you'd have to become intelligent upon. But all these things that they did, she says, they were lessons in parables teaching the necessity of a work of regeneration in the inward heart for the purification of the soul, dead in trespasses and sins, and also the necessity of the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. In summary, what is she trying to say there? Two things. So the work of regeneration in the inward heart and purification of the soul, that's asking God to forgive us. That's what we call justification. But then it says what? Sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough God just to cleanse us from sin. He wants to keep us clean as well. Do you see that? If you wash a pig and you open the door, what's the pig going to do? Jump right back into the mud. God doesn't want us to just be cleaned out and the next minute we jump in the mud again. And then again, be cleaned out and then jump in the mud again. He wants to clean us up and then he wants us, what? To stay clean. Too often, we look at the first part of cleansing, which is God forgive me. But many of us do not experience sanctification. And so we come to this conclusion. It's okay for us to sin until Jesus comes. Because none of us, have you had victory? Have you had victory? And none of us dare say we have. But the standard that God has set in the scripture has been very high for us. He wants us to remain clean. Do you see that? And so we come to the gate again. And there's something else that is very interesting that is mentioned here in Exodus 27, 16, as you see it highlighted. The gate of the court, there's a hanging of 20 cubits of three colors. What are they? Blue, purple, and scarlet. And then it's made of fine twined linen. So let's start with the material first. But I want you to remember the three colors. And this is really what I call the gospel of colors. You're going to see it in a minute. But what does linen represent in the Bible? Revelation 19 verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So linen represents what in scripture? Righteousness. What is righteousness? It's simply right doing. So if you read Romans chapter three, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that does anything right. None of us are righteous. We need the righteousness of Christ. We can't from that point, like you got to understand this, right? When we sin, we soil our garments. It's like your past is forever stained, right? But wait a minute, doesn't Jesus wash us and make us clean, right? He does, but the thing is this, our past record still stands against us. Does that make sense? The only way that we can really be made clean is, Jesus says, take off your filthy garment, take it off, and I'll give you mine. Do you see that? That's justification. When you put on his garment, everything that you've done in the past, oh, well, it's perfect. Why? Oh, that looks like Jesus' life. Because it is. That's justification. However, there's something for us, us to contend with, which is what? 
the present and future. We really can't contend with the future, right? It's only really then just the present. Every day, I've got to be careful, don't get that garment dirty. That's sanctification, you see? But when we look at this fine linen, that is Christ's righteousness, his perfect obedience, his life for mine. It's not a fair swap, but salvation was no nothing ever to do with being fair. If anyone should complain, it not being fair, it should be who? It should be Jesus, right? How come he gets a clean garment and I get a dirty one? But you never heard Jesus do that, right? He willingly takes our dirty garment and he gives us his clean one. Salvation was never fair in the eyes of heaven. But he did it because he loved us, amen? Who is that righteousness? 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, friends, we can only approach the Father through Jesus. This is why we must pray in Jesus' name. You know, this is becoming a more and more uh, popular phenomenon, that we like to end our prayers without praying in Jesus' name. And I'm not saying that God is so particular that if you don't say it, he's not gonna hear it. But you know what, friends? The importance of ending in Christ's name, in saying in Jesus' name, is so important. It's only through him that we can have even entrance into heaven. It's only through him that even the Father bothers to listen to our prayers. Do you see that? So if we accept Jesus into our heart, friends, we are accepting his righteousness. Do you see that? Sometimes we think that we accept Christ, but we're allowed to keep our filthy garments. Absolutely not. To surrender fully to Christ is to allow him to live in our hearts and it's to accept his life, his actions, his desires, his thoughts, his character. Accepting Christ's righteousness, friends, it works a change in our behavior and our actions. The inward change is made evident in the outward actions. Our words, where we go, what we do, how we live our life. So we're not saved by our works, but a person without good works is probably not a person who is saved. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a very fine balance. We are saved by grace through faith. It's in the heart, right? And there is a man in the Bible who had no good works, but I guarantee you he's saved. Who is it? It's a thief on the cross, right? He never had the opportunity to display his good works because he perished quickly after, isn't it? But I'm telling you, a person who is saved here, the life will show it. The actions will begin to change. The words will begin to change. Our habits of life will begin to change. That's what righteousness really is all about, friends. It is an outward act but it's evidence of what's happening in here first. But coming back to this, what were the three colors? Blue, scarlet, which is what color? Red, and then purple. So let's go through these colors. They're really important. And I'm gonna start with red, scarlet. What does red represent in the Bible? Isaiah chapter one, I hope you can read this. Can you see that? Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So what does the red color represent? Sin, right? But in the light of the sanctuary, the red there is Christ's shed blood for us. The blood that is being shed is not our blood, is it? You're not going there and, okay, I'm here to die. 
No, right? You brought a lamb and you're going to kill that lamb and his life for yours. So when you see that red, what do you see? You see grace. You see sacrifice for sin. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? So that, that red is not necessarily just sin, but how that sin is really grace standing on your behalf. Then we come to the color blue. It's a bit more longer. Uh, can you see that? If you can't, I'll read the text to you. Numbers 15, 38 and 39, okay? Numbers 15, 38 and 39. What does blue represent in the Bible? Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout the generations. And that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of what? Blue. So all the, all the children of Israel, they had their robes. They have a, a, the hem there, it was blue. Over here it was blue. Over here it was blue. So they had a ribbon of blue all around their garments. For what reason? And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the what? Commandments of the Lord and not just that, but do them. And that ye seek not after your own hearts and your own eyes after which ye use to go a whoring. So the ribbon of blue was to be reminded to the children of Israel to do what? To do the commandments of God, Okay. What do we call that? Simply obedience to God's commandments, all right? So red, sacrifice for sin. Blue, obedience. Then we come to the purple. John chapter 19 and verses two and three. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. These were the soldiers that were mocking Jesus. And they decided to put a, 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 a cloak of purple over him. And they called him what? King of the Jews. And even today, the purple represents what? It's royalty. So you see these three colors. Red, blue, blue and purple, God's grace, sacrifice for our sins. Blue, obedience to all of God's commandments, and purple, royalty. And these are the colors of the material, what was the material again? Linen. What did the linen represent? Righteousness. If we are to be righteous, we need these three things. We need sacrifice, we need obedience, and we need royalty. And you know what's very interesting? Jesus is the hangings, right? He's the gate. He's the entrance. He is righteousness. All of this points to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know what? You will find these three steps outlined in the scripture that Jesus went through. Let me show you. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. When you see one of the colors, I want you to tell me stop, okay? And it's not going to be the actual color, red, blue, or purple, but when you see sacrifice, when you see obedience, when you see royalty, I want you to tell me to stop, okay? I'm going to read it. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. What color is that? That's the blue. Unto death, even, ah, I heard someone say stop, and the rest of you missed it. What color is that? That's red. That's sacrifice. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Ah, what's that? And given him a name which is above every name. Even in the life of Christ, he learnt by experience these three colors. He understood what it meant to obey. He understood what it meant to sacrifice. And it was only after he was resurrected and ascended up to heaven that God gave him a name above all other names and exalted him. How did he become king? Here's a little bit of a pop quiz. 
of the three colors, what do you add to which one to get which color? Right? The red plus blue equals purple, right? If you add sacrifice and obedience together, God will make you royal. Not here on earth, not to be a superstar, not to be someone worshiped here, not to be a king who wears a crown and sits on a throne or marry one and to become a queen. But God says in the future, I will exalt you as I have exalted my son. But the lessons that we must learn today is the lessons of sacrifice and obedience. But you know what's very interesting? The Antichrist has her own colors. Look at this. Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in what colors? Purple and scarlet. She's missing which one? She's missing blue. And decked with gold and precious stones. You see that? She has her royalty and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. The Antichrist is missing one of the two colors. Three colors, pardon me. She only has red and purple. And you know, look at what the Bible describes about her red and her purple. In verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, she became royalty by marrying the kings of the earth. Not the way that God wanted it to, to happen. But not just that. Where's the red? Verse 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Oh, she has sacrificed her right, but it's not sacrifice for her sins. It's sacrifice of what? The martyrs, the saints. Those that disagreed with her, she crucified them. She killed them, burnt them at the stake, fed them to wild beasts, put them in dungeons and tortured them. She had read all right, but it wasn't the red outlined in Scripture. See, friends, she's missing that blue. She doesn't obey God's Ten Commandments. She doesn't know what it means to, to sacrifice self and our own personal opinions and all these things and to accept the righteousness of Christ in living an obedient life. When you look at the sanctuary, you actually see in big picture these three colors. Do you know that? In the courtyard, you see the color red. This is where they sacrifice all the animals. In the holy place, you see the color blue. It's where you learn to live an obedient life. And in the most holy place is the color purple. It's where you see God face to face. And he says, my son, my daughter, sit on my throne. You become royalty. What are these steps? The first step is justification. God making us clean. The second step, learning to be obedient. It's sanctification. It's not just you're sorry for the sins of the past, but now you want to change and stop doing the bad things of the past, but you want to be obedient. You see that? And the last is glorification. And that's for God to do. It's not our part. It's where we'll be changed into his image. And Jesus says, that's it. I'm coming for my own. I'm going to bring them up to heaven. In Revelation 3, the greatest promise ever given to the Laodicean church, if they overcome, I will grant them to sit with me in my Father's throne. If that isn't royalty, I don't know what is. You see, friends, when you look at the colors in the sanctuary, the children of Israel understood it. They knew what it meant. I mean, we read from the book of Numbers about the color red. I mean, the color blue. They knew that it meant obedience. They knew that red color because they saw it in the courtyard for some every day. 
sacrificing that lamb, spilling its blood, confessing their sins, they understood the process. But friends, before we ever get to the courtyard, do you remember there were two things? Self-realization and then willingness is built upon that. If we realize our condition, if we realize our need, then willingness is easy. Willing to do what though? Willing to sacrifice and willing to obey. You know, as a mother, and I don't speak from experience because I'm not, but as a mother, they are willing to sacrifice for their children. Wake up in the middle of the night. Not as a father, I'm not willing. It's just you can't wake me up. <laughs> Somehow the mother's ear is tuned to the frequency of their children's cries. At just a squeak, they're awake. Isn't it? And they're willing to sacrifice because of love. You see, friends, you cannot have commitment without sacrifice. You can't obey if you're not willing to sacrifice. Some of us, maybe we're stuck in a round of disobedience because we're not willing to sacrifice our fellowship with our friends. They're dragging us down. Are you with me? Some of us, we, we're not able to obey and to, to put into practice all these things because we're not willing to sacrifice our own ambitions. Right? And people will come to me and say, Ben, you don't understand. They like to say that to me. And sure, I don't understand it. It's okay. I don't understand that they came from a poor family and an upbringing and, and all their hopes and all the ambitions of the family were, were placed upon this person's shoulders and they were the key to get the family, family out of poverty. And all of a sudden I come and tell them about the Sabbath. They've got to stop working or they've got to stop studying on the Sabbath. And their plans come to a screeching halt, you know? But if we're to obey, friends, it requires sacrifice. Whoever wants to be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. But the sacrifice that Jesus calls us to is never the sacrifice that he did. All of us combined could never carry the cross of Christ. But he still calls us to a life of sacrifice. You know, friends, the work that began with sacrifice, Ellen White tells us, will end in even greater sacrifice. And it's not just sacrifice of your money, tithe and offering. God today calls for sacrifice of your time. Time to serve me. Time to get involved in the work of the ministry. Not just on Sabbath, friends. If you are struggling just to turn up at church, I'm telling you, this next step, you're gonna to totally say, Ben, you're being unreasonable. But on the Sabbath day, if, if you are finding it difficult to sacrifice for God, how about the other six days? Do you think the church, the world, pardon me, do you think the world is gonna be won over to by God because of the 24 hours that we work for God on the Sabbath? Of course not. If you are struggling with sacrifice from Friday night to Saturday night, I shudder to think what I would need to do to rouse you up to serve God on a Sunday or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night. Are you with me? Jesus, he says, I need you to be willing to sacrifice. Do you understand what sacrifice is? When you put your, you know, some of us, we've paid tithes for so long. Your money comes in, you're happily like, dum, da -dum, da -dum. okay, here's $200, here's $500, here's $1,000 for God, you know. Here's, a, here's my 10% God, and you just, you press send, or you put it in the, uh, in the envelope, and you put it in the church bag, and you don't think about it, right? 
Is that sacrifice? Mm -mm. You know what that is called? It's called a good godly habit already. But to you, it's no longer sacrifice. It's when the preacher gets up and says, now you've got to give 10% offering. What happens? You go home and you're pacing back and forth. You're wondering whether this, this preacher has, has spoken the truth or not. You, you got to go back to your budget and you got to look at it and you got to crunch the numbers and you're like, God, are you sure? Oh, but we're, we're saving up for, for a trip or I'm saving up for a car or there's an emergency and we just, God, are you sure? And you begin to struggle. Then it's sacrifice. Does that make sense? When you come to church and you're here from 9.30, some of us are nine o'clock and you're here till 2 p.m., wow, that's five hours. Do you know how much money you could earn in five hours on a Saturday? How much? 200, 300, 400? You, you know what I mean? It's time and a half, maybe double if it's a public holiday as well, right? I hope you're not ready to like rebel or something. You're having a bit of a chatter there. But sacrifice is when you have to think twice, three times, four times, five times about it. Sacrifice, you got to pray about it. It's not just a passing thought. Okay, you said it, done. Or maybe you're like, I'm doing that already. Sacrifice. You really got to get on your knees and say, God, you got to help me. Because let me tell you, sacrifice for God does not come naturally. It doesn't. Even when the early church was advancing and thousands were getting baptized in a day, there was this couple who were caught up with the, this whole revolution. The names were Ananias and Sapphira. And they sold their house. They sold their land. But Satan caught them in a pause of a moment. And they kept back part of the money. Maybe they thought that they were deluded for a minute. Maybe they thought they made a rash decision. And so they only came with part of the price of the land and the house. You know, friends, sometimes the longer we think about these things, the less we're likely to act on it, isn't it? We reason our way out of even being willing to sacrifice. But friends, God is calling all of us to another level of sacrifice. And I haven't even started talking about your houses and land. Are you with me? I haven't even touched your car yet. I'm just asking for your time. Every Wednesday night, we have a Bible study. It's not for you. You maybe have studied Daniel three, four, five times. If you've been a faithful Adventist, you've gone to every Revelation and Daniel seminar that's out there. And now with the advance and dawn of YouTube, you've watched countless of them maybe as well. And maybe you even sit in the pews. You know, I had my treasurer in, back in Malaysia. He says, Ben, I don't even know what Bible text you're going to say next. <laughs> I said, well, it's not for you. Did you bring a friend? Are you with me? But in order for you to invite your friend, you got to be present as well. That, my dear friends, requires sacrifice. The world is not going to be one to Christ just in the 24 hours of the Sabbath day that God has given to us. My dear friends, it's going to require some of you to sacrifice your work time. Yes, take some of your off days. It's called annual leave to serve God. Are you with me? Oh, you're not. Don't take your off days just to go on a holiday. Take some of your off days during the evangelistic series, during Faith FM, whatever it is to make it possible so that you can bring somebody to Jesus. That's the sacrifice that God 
is calling us to because too often we have become, become content to just serve God in the pockets of free time that we have without being intentional about serving Him. My dear friends, the sacrifice that God is calling to us today is much higher than what our pioneers ever gave. I think I've mentioned this before to some of you. I feel embarrassed sometimes with the amount of riches that God has blessed me with. When I begin to read Ellen White and she says, praise God, we have chairs, even though none of them are matching. You know what I mean? And I think about the sacrifice that is needed in, those, in our days, and, and, I, and I compare myself to those that lived 150 years ago. My sacrifice is just not even in comparison. It pales in comparison. And I wonder, God, how are you going to finish the work through me? How? And it's not that you have to have old rickety chairs and then you come across as righteous, or that you can't drive a new car, or get a new house, all of those things that I've experienced. But it's how are we giving our very best to God? Is God the number one? Do you see that? And so God today is calling us to a higher sacrifice. And if you're struggling, friends, I just want you to look at the cross. Just look at the cross. All of heaven was poured out in that one gift, we're told. Do you know the very least that was needed to save us was what? What was the very least that God had to do in order to save us? What was it? This is not a trick question. What was it? It is a sacrifice of Christ, right? The very least that God had to do to save you and me as sinners was let Jesus hang on that, that shameful cross. But do you know what? The very most that God could give us, do you know what it was? It was Jesus hanging on the cross. The very least was met with the very most that heaven could ever give. God could do no more. He could pour out no greater blessing than to give us his son Jesus. And so friends, if you're struggling with some sacrifice in your life, a sacrifice of a pet sin, a sacrifice of time to give more to God, not more to me. When you serve the church and I'm in that church, you're not serving me, you're still serving God. Sacrifice maybe in a career. God says, just look at the cross and you will cry out, heaven is cheap enough. We're going to get to heaven one day and we're gonna cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. You know why? Because all of us, I believe, are gonna have some level of regret. Jesus, forgive me because I know I could have done more. The reward that you give me pales into comparison to, to the sacrifice that I had to give to obtain this. We're going to cry out, heaven is cheap enough. Amen? Today, you can't outgive God. Even if you quit your job right now, you sell your house and your car and, and give up every worldly possession that you hold so dear and you serve him in a foreign land, you're still going to cry out, heaven is cheap enough. So the only question that remains for us today is this. What is God calling each and every one of you to in relation to sacrifice? I can't answer, answer for you. I can only answer for myself. I can't even answer for my children. I hope and I pray that they will be involved in service in some way. But that's for them to figure out between them and God. It's for all of us to ask, God, what would you have me to do today in 2024? I don't sit here by mistake. You're not sat here by mistake listening to this sermon. It's not preached in a, to a particular sermon in the audience. This is the message of the sanctuary. And Jesus says, 
I'm waiting for who will stand and say, here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you so much for giving us Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the greatest gift you could ever give. Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to despise the greatness and the riches of this, this gift, but that we would allow Jesus to come into our hearts today. Lord, you're calling us to a higher level of sacrifice. Sacrifice of our, our sins, sacrifice of things, those things that we hold so dear, that we love, that we just know that are not good for us. Or maybe it's sacrifice to serve you. I pray that you would guide us, Lord. Speak to each of our hearts. Help us to see where you're calling each and every one of us. We would like to surrender our lives again to you, Lord. Please come in and take control before we change our minds, Lord. Save us in spite of ourselves, we pray in Jesus' name.